Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by Inside the Penguins. Dot com. We have a busy day today because plenty of news has happened early in this week. Nothing really that primarily affects the on-ice product for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Maybe a little bit in the Mike Vellucci extension, which we'll get to in the second segment of this show. But we're really going to talk about that. We're going to talk a little bit about the Beauty League because it is the best and basically only Pro-Am tournament in the summer. At least the premier one that yeah. people think about when it comes to the NHL players. But we're going to lead it off with this because this really was the main story of the week as of right now. Could the Robo Pen be returning to the Pittsburgh Penguins for real this time? Because Adidas has two years left on its current NHL contract. They're not renewing it. That news came out earlier in the summer. So maybe they're going to try to go out with a bang. We already saw whatever his name, the Fisherman for the Islanders, is going to be the concept for their reverse retro 2.0, which... Let's be honest, the Islanders had the worst initial reverse retro because they just changed the color of the blue on their jerseys. But, I mean, I buried the lead there a little bit. Adidas is bringing out a new set of reverse retros. That's that's where all this is stemming from. And the rumor is that the Penguins will be heading back to the RoboPen. Now, there are two different ways that they could go because there are two different jerseys that the RoboPen was on. And I'll bring them up here. There was the white. There was a little bit more plain. And then there was the black gradient, which is what everybody is looking for. So Horwat, what do you think about the potential return of the Robo Pen? I think it's interesting. I think it could be a ton of fun. People also forget <clears throat> that uh, the Robo Pen or the Pigeon, if you will, mm-hmm. um, did make its appearance. Did make an appearance as I'm trying to find it now. Um, as late as what was it? Right before Reebok, it was the shoulder patch logo for a long time too. Mm. in the Vegas gold. Uh, people are going to forget about that. I just wanted to get that out of the way now just because let's say we get that uniform again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? Looking back at it, I totally did not. like Looking back at that like triangle uniform, I don't hate it. But that being said, this robo pen, what we're talking about here, I am intrigued by the concept of it. I don't know why people don't do gradients anymore. I'm looking at the uniform as a whole. I don't like that the sleeves are different designs, but that's, you know, of the black one I, that's nitpicking though but if we go to the white one and reverse it somehow because that's what it's kind of supposed to be make it a black uniform of that mm-hmm. i don't hate this i I like where this is going um i think we've kind of used up the we've used up the diagonal of pittsburgh enough so i don't think it'll be anything like that unless they go all yellow which i swear to god if we go all <laughs> yellow the only time the all yellow is acceptable is if it is like the original lemieux jersey hmm that far back yeah so basically just putting yellow onto the current day jersey pretty pretty much and yeah. i believe it was like a different ish sleeve design but mm-hmm. um again nitpicking here <laughs> so for those that are just listening instead of watching us on youtube at inside the penguins these jerseys are the ones that were used between 1992 and 2002 in different variations they were also alternates Early on, they were alternates late in their tenure, but there was a stretch between 1997 and 2002 where these were the primary jerseys for the Pittsburgh Penguins. So if you want to see what we're talking about, either check us out on YouTube at Inside the Penguins and you can check this video out at Return of the Robo Pen or just look up 1997 to 2000, yeah, 1997 to 2002 Pittsburgh Penguins highlights and you're going to see these jerseys and and the ones we're talking about the white one is is the preliminary lemieux one that i have that has basically the diagonal on the shoulders with the robo penguin and again if you don't know what logo that is it's basically the only one that's not the skating penguin and then the black one is the the famous or infamous gradient because it's funny i think this is probably the most 50 50 I've ever seen anybody on a jersey. Half the people love the gradient. Half the people absolutely hate it. What do you think? I think people want what they can't have in a lot of cases. And then once we get it, we're going to hate it. So Mm -hmm. it, because let's look at the, at uh, Vancouver. They're the ones that did it in the last reverse retro situation. Yeah. Whereas the red and blue, I feel like, I mean, I don't know. They're across, literally across the border and across the country from, 
any sort of semblance of how I understand Vancouver and what they like or dislike about their jerseys. I thought the red to blue was enjoyed at least a little bit in Vancouver. Uh, they did it blue to green in the reverse retro. So I think maybe people wanted it, wanted it, wanted it, and then they got it and it was, oh, now we don't want it anymore. People mm-hmm. want something they can't have. And once they get it, it is, all right, we don't want this anymore. What's the next thing? Because I can remember a lot of people wanted, I think they, yeah, I think a lot of people wanted the, the in Pittsburgh here, they wanted the, the diagonal Pittsburgh forever. Mm-hmm. Like, can we get the, can we get the word mark? Can we get the word mark? Then they got it and it was, all right, great. I want this instead now. It was mm-hmm. almost immediate. I remember we, I think if you were to dig through these old episodes, you'd find where I said that, where it yeah. was almost immediately after the revert, the first reverse retro was announced. Mm-hmm. People wanted something different from us. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting, but for what it's worth, we've run everything else into the ground. We've seen it all. We're still going to be using the diagonal Mm-hmm. As a third, we're still going to get, like you mentioned, a winter classic uniform into the fold here. Things could be different. Things could be changed there for that game as well. Mm-hmm. For this reverse retro, it'll be interesting to see. And I believe if we do get the Robo Penguin, I won't be mad at it. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the thing. The Pittsburgh Penguins are going to wear five different jerseys throughout this season, including, obviously, the preliminary home and road jerseys. You mentioned the Pittsburgh Diagonal is still going to be the third. That is the black Pittsburgh Diagonal. And then also, we're expecting this reverse retro. There's going to be a Winter Classic jersey, so plenty of jerseys. But I think the big thing about it, people are going to always want this gradient. I understand that we saw the same thing with the Pittsburgh Diagonal. I still think that the execution on the Pittsburgh diagonal jerseys was really good. I I think they look great, especially the black ones. I think they look extremely good on the ice. Here's the thing. People are going to be upset with this if the execution isn't done properly. And that's what I think it is. It's not, hey, we're upset or we don't care that you brought the concept back, even though we've been clamoring for it for the past five, six, seven, however many years. It's, hey, we wanted it. And what you gave us wasn't really what we expected. Because honestly, to me, if they go directly back to this, and we're pulling up on our our YouTube again, this is a very visual episode, a picture of Alexei Kovalev in the Pittsburgh Penguins gradient. If they just simply bring this back and make it white, then I don't want it. I want it modernized a little bit because not going to lie, when I see this, I think it's a great jersey. And for the time, it was perfect. And this might be a hot take, but if they brought this back, I wouldn't be happy with it. I mean, I don't care at the end of the day, it's a jersey. But I want something a little bit more inventive. Get creative. You're Adidas. You're running out of runway here with the NHL. It seems like they're trying to swing it out of the park for the last couple of jerseys. This is an opportunity for them to hit it completely out of the park because Penguins fans want it so badly. If they execute, you're going to see these all over PPG Paints Arena. You're absolutely right. And as I try and maneuver a cat out of the way here, (laughs) I'm going to say give me this uniform layout and design. Mm -hmm. but with the current logo because it's a skating penguin Mm -hmm. the the partial stripes on the side can almost look like it is actually in motion for once Mm -hmm. um so i wouldn't hate it even if we didn't actually switch the logo people are talking about the logo the logo how about the how about we just go to that jersey but Mm -hmm. with the logo we have I don't know if that's the concept everyone's going for and i get we've already seen the leaked t-shirt with the robo pen on it Mm -hmm. But at this point, I, it, at this point, we are kind of rolling with it's going to be the Robo Pen. Let's just see the layout of everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we were to do this again, I wouldn't hate the idea of the current iteration of the Penguin we have with the triangle. For the love of God, do not t- get rid of that triangle again. Yeah. <laughs> and then tacking on uh, that gradient around <clears throat> all the way around the body with the stripage on the one sleeve and the other. And, Going from there. I like the gray, too. Let's utilize gray a little more. Mm -hmm. You know? That's just me. Yeah, this is one of the few jerseys, maybe the only jersey in Pittsburgh Penguins history, other than I think that one stadium series jersey was so weird against the Chicago Blackhawks. I don't know if there was gray in it. I don't think Silver because it was supposed to be metallic. Yeah, yeah. That that was the only other time I can think of gray or silver being used in a Penguins uniform. But as far as that goes and and your opinion, I, I honestly would rather see you know, I would rather see the Robo Pen because I do like the logo in concept. That is basically yeah. the concept that we went for the 
for the uh, logo of the show, like the tip of the iceberg logo. There's little hints of that Robo Penguin logo on it, but of course changed because of copyright and stuff like that. But nonetheless, I, I think that's a really good idea to go back to that. And it's Adidas hitting it out of the park. If they're able to, you're going to see it all over the place because people are going to just have been clamoring for it for forever. And I think it's different than the Pittsburgh gin and juice jerseys, the diagonal, because at the end of the day, it is just a Pittsburgh diagonal. I love those jerseys. I still want the black version. I have the white version, but that's never going to be worn for certain reasons. But I think we also need to realize, and let's talk about it a little bit. There's going to be a fifth Jersey. So Mm -hmm. there's, all sorts of stuff happening when it comes to the visuals of the Pittsburgh Penguins this year. Let's quickly talk about that a little bit because this feels like that the Robo Pen feels like the last real retro that the Pittsburgh Penguins have left to choose from. It really is, unless they want to go back to the dark blue again, uh, the yeah. certain dark blue, the Rick Kehoe era dark blue, not that thing they invented for the 2011 classic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with that shade of blue, I believe it was around that. Uh, it's also hard to talk about jerseys because. I don't know. We're not art majors. So we don't no. know like the exact coloring of blues. But that being said, unless you go back to that Rick Kehoe era of blue, which I don't hate, I do not hate the idea of going to blue. That's just me mm-hmm. um, because I like things to change and be different. But it seems like if we're going to do this thing with Boston, <laughs> um, <laughs> ugh, sorry, I've been cat sitting. So I'm going to bring him in for a minute. Yeah. Um, if we're going to do this thing with Boston, I don't know why. We go pre-Penguins and go all the way back to the Pittsburgh Pirates. I think me, you, and Doug were talking about this. Especially if you're trying to match eras, mm-hmm. give us a brown, not a not a black and yellow, give us a brown Bruins jersey. And then, I'm sorry, your idea of the battle of black and gold happens every time they play. What what it, what difference does Fenway make? Because you also have to figure. It's Fenway. When was Fenway made or opened? I don't know. Go back to that, literal to that era, the 20s. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, hold on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. In the 20s era of the Bruins, the, uh, the Pirates, and Fenway. It all fits mm-hmm. a little more perfectly when you put it into the concept of it. it is at Fenway Park. And here's the thing. I, I do, as you were saying and alluding to there, I do want to see the battle of the black and gold because it's an outdoor game. It's a special event. Make two really good black and gold jerseys. Obviously not similar because you have to be able to watch it. It has to be visually pleasing. But make two really good black and gold jerseys that can be distinctified and distinctly different and make them look good. That's what I want. Brown, I can I can get with brown. But what some people were saying with, oh, the Penguins should go to the Pittsburgh Hornets. That was Ronald McDonald colors. People saying, oh, go back to the blue. No, why are we going to do that? If anything, I do like the Pittsburgh Pirates thing, especially because, you know, playing on a baseball diamond, playing at Fenway, Maybe this will be the first time a team, the Pirates color, wins a big game on national television this century. But yes, I, I'm okay with that. But I do think, and I think I've heard from a lot of people that are pretty well in the know, um, that they will probably be going back to far reverse retro, like far retro in that Pirates era, in that Hornets era, something back then. I believe Taylor Haas of DK Pittsburgh Sports put out a story about this a long time ago. So if you want to see it, obviously go check that out. Or I think she just retweeted it here recently, but they're going far back for that. And that's fine. So if you get a nineties and then a twenties throwback, it's going to be great to compliment the other nineties throwback that the Penguins are using as their current third Jersey. I, overall, I think the Penguins just have really good Jersey combinations, really good kits, if you will. And I think it's only going to get better this year. I trust Adidas. I think they've done a really good job since taking over. And it's kind of sad that they're already bowing out after the 2023, 24 season. Yeah. But there are plenty of companies that can take over and do just as good. I mean, CCM yeah. maybe, I mean, I know they do uh, minor league hockey and juniors, but I think they could step into the NHL pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, that being said, uh, Fenway broke ground in 1911 was open in 1912. So if you really do want to go that far back, like we mentioned, we have, old pirate uniforms, Pittsburgh hockey pirate uniforms uh, to use. Matter of fact, that does fit so well because it's at Fenway. It is baseball. And the pirates of hockey were uh, wore black and gold before mm-hmm. the pirates of baseball did. So there's a little, little tidbit for you, a little, little fact. And then in Boston about that era, 
You have their brown. Now give me some stripes, by the way. There's a ton of stripes in on Boston, old Boston Bruins sleeves. So mm-hmm. you could see some interesting brown and yellow from the Bruins. I think this is going to be a ton of fun. Your battle of black and gold, it's interesting, but it happens literally every time they play. We just don't talk about it. And then uh, baseball field, old school, because Fenway is such an old park. It's 110 years old. Make everything old as hell. Yeah, I don't hate the brown and gold when you brought that up because I think it's it's similar enough, and I like that old-timey feel, especially at a place like Fenway. So we're going to take a quick break. When we return, a little bit of more recent news, a little bit of news surrounding the actual team on the ice. We'll get into that right after the break. Fellas, fantasy football draft season is right around the corner. CD Lamb is good, but have you seen these beautiful balls? It's time to get your snake looking right for this snake draft with the sponsor of today's show, Manscaped. The leaders in below the waist grooming have created a championship lineup with their performance package 4.0. Join the 6 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get ready for kickoff by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with code ALLSTEALERS. Slotted at quarterback, we have the Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer. This spaceship is here to guide you on a journey to trim your body balls and even your A-gap. This fourth generation trimmer also features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawn Mower 4.0 also has a 4000K LED spotlight which allows you to be as accurate as Bill Belichick with the challenge flag. Get 20% off and free shipping with code ALLSTEALERS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code ALLSTEALERS at manscaped.com. It's time to put the PP back in PPR and get a grip on your pigskin this season with Manscaped. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by Inside the Penguins. Dot com. We talked on Monday's episode, hell, it was the intro and the main thumbnail on Monday's episode that Todd Reardon had been promoted to associate coach and given a two-year extension. Well, just about five minutes after our episode aired, Mike Vellucci also signed a two-year extension. No promotion as of what we know now, but he was signed to a two-year extension. Now, Vellucci in the offseason received very heightened interest from the Boston Bruins, who we were just talking about, as well as the Philadelphia Flyers to be their next head coach. In fact, even had, a believe, a two-hour interview with the Flyers that went apparently very well, according to Elliot Friedman of 32 Thoughts, the podcast and Sportsnet, but still doesn't get into that brotherhood of the head coaches. He will eventually, I'm going to say that right now, he will eventually become a head coach in the National Hockey League. He has too much of a pedigree. Over 20 years in juniors, four different championships amongst three different leagues in juniors. The guy is just a proven winner, and he's done a very good job with the Pittsburgh Penguins in his two years as assistant coach. Now, what does he do? For those of you that don't know, he coaches the penalty kill as well as the forwards. And if you look at the penalty kill success, it's weird. It's like the inverted results of Todd Reardon because remember Reardon's first year power play really good second year really bad first year of Mike Vellucci for the penalty kill really bad 77.4 percent in 2020-21 which was good for 27th in the National Hockey League but then last season that improved to 84.4 percent good for third in the National Hockey League so Horwat, what do you think about Vellucci being behind the bench for another two seasons for the Pittsburgh Penguins I remember the penalty kill being a lot better than that, but um, it's going to be a good move. It's going to be a solid decision for these next couple seasons because he because of that defensive pedigree he brings to the penalty kill and to our forward guys like Teddy Bluger. Maybe he can bring something out of Brock McGinn on the kill. There's all kind of new options he can do. Maybe he can get a little more offensive on the kill if they decide to put Kapanen down there like they should. There's all different kinds of things that can move and shake with a penalty kill specifically that he can be a big uh, brain behind. Our forwards are going to be our forwards. When it comes to teaching, like when we talked about Reardon, we discussed how good he did with our defense Mm -hmm. and making sure the defensive core stayed on top of its game. He took in projects like CeCe and Matheson and turned them into something. Mm -hmm. He kept Latang at the top of his game. Whereas Volucci here, I think – 
his main purpose is the penalty kill because our forwards are going to be our forwards. They're going to be coached by Mike, Mike Sullivan and they're going to, especially the, the, the big ones, they're going to be the superstars that they are. There's not much, too much more coaching you can do for guys that are in their 16th, 17th season and can just, they know how to control the game. Mm-hmm. So there's not too much coaching that goes on for guys like Crosby, Malkin, uh, Rust, Gensel, if you need to. It's going to be giving guys like Heinen and, you know, like I already said, McGinn and whoever fills in the last spot. Maybe it's Drew O'Connor. Maybe it's Redeem Zahorna. Guys like that that can step up and to go under Mike Volucci's tutelage, if you will, and become a solid depth piece for this team. We know mm-hmm. our top six is going to be our top six. They just have to perform the right way, and that's on them. I get Volucci coached it, but a lot of Mike Sullivan, that's a lot of Mike Sullivan's doing as well. Uh, but if Mike Volucci can come in and continue to stay in, uh, get our penalty kill to where it is, keep it at that track, which is very nice. Mm-hmm. and get maybe the more of the depth forwards to step up and do a little more. It's a win-win. All the coaches now line up at the end of 23-24. Mm-hmm. So give it two more seasons, there's going to be a little bit of an interesting shakeup maybe. Mm-hmm. And also that lines up with the uh, end of Adidas to tie it into our first conversation. Yeah. But no, uh, as far as the forwards are concerned, when I look at that, obviously everything on this team, the buck stops it at Mike Sullivan. He has to take credit for everything, and he usually does. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to, to, to Mike Bellucci, I don't put deployment on him. I also think Sullivan is the primary factor in who gets deployed where and how they get deployed on the forward side. But when I look at Bellucci, I want to see how the guys not named Crosby, the guys not named Malkin, are able to progress this season. Yeah. A Danton Heinen, can he replicate what he did last year? Kasperi Kapanen is going to be huge. I think Bellucci... If Captain bounces back, Volucci is going to be the chief reason that he does so. Because, like you said, Captain needs to be used on the penalty kill. He was yes. in Toronto. He has all the tools and abilities to be able to be successful in that spot. And he's getting paid so much money, if he's not going to score, at least be good on the penalty kill. So yep. a guy like that, what does the bottom line do? How does Jeff Carter do? How is he able to manage workload for Jeff Carter? I think that also falls into Mike Sullivan's area of expertise. Whoever that fourth line left wing is, Paling, O'Connor, Zahorna, whoever it is, Nylander, I don't care who it is, that success I'm going to judge against Mike Bellucci. And when it comes to the penalty kill specifically, last year it was very good. At points, it was number one in the National Hockey League for month on end, over 90% success rate. There was a lot of a drop after Zach Aston Reese left the trade deadline. That's a big blow yeah. to a penalty kill unit. There's a lot of things that people can say about Zach Aston Reese, but he's one of the premier penalty killers in the National Hockey League, and that was a blow to that unit. How do you bounce back from that? How do you perform without a guy like Zach Aston Reese for a full season on that unit? It's obviously very important how good Tristan Jari is because everybody always says it. Your goaltender is your best penalty killer. It's also very important how healthy Chris Letang is because he is your best penalty killer still. As a, is part of it, yes. Yeah, but I, I'm ex- excited to see and interested to see what happens on the forward side of that penalty kill unit. Does Kapanen get used? Is Bluger's obviously a big name there. Does Carter get used more often? What do you do with Drew O'Connor? Josh Archibald, does he get on that unit? I want to see how that penalty kill does with that Zach Aston Reese. That's going to be a huge indicator whether or not Mike Belushi has a hand on this or if he was relying on Czar, who, again, one of the best penalty killers in the league. I think it could use a little change, but because without Zach Aston Reese, it took a dip. A little bit of a change in that in that lineup could benefit it. And I think Kaplan's a key piece there, like I keep saying. Because, yeah, he has the tools and the trades to become a decent penalty killer as a depth forward as well. But then he, you know he can score. Suddenly you have an extra a small a small scoring threat with a man with a man down. That was Teddy Bluger's, not bread and butter, but we know he's able to do uh, something like that whenever he's given his opportunities on the penalty kill mm-hmm. to become a new scoring threat at an inopportune time. Mm-hmm. Why not? I mean, I'm not saying pair him with Kapanen. <laughs> or pair the, those two together, but have that chance, have that extra threat whenever you may need it. Mm-hmm. Um, utilize them sometimes if you need to. I don't know. It's 
Uh, something you'll need to change in that sort of lineup there, especially with the forwards, like you said. We know Bluger's going to be there. We assume McGinn's going to be there. We assume everyone that's not on the on the power play is mm-hmm. going to filter into the penalty kill because that's usually how it's been. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked to see someone pull double duty this year too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Brian Rust is a guy that following the trade deadline got a lot of time on the penalty kill. I'm going to say this right now. I don't want to see Brian Rust log more. If, if there's six penalty minutes that the Penguins take in a game, I don't want to see him log more than 25 seconds. He, I, the Penguins are best when he is focusing on offense and not using him up and using his minutes up on the penalty kill because, again, put Kapanen out there instead. Yeah. Like, I, I get that a lot of people think that Kapanen's a defensive liability. Ka- Kapanen's defense was actually one of his best parts of last season. Now, his turnover in the offensive zone wasn't great, but his defensive play was not horrendous. It, it was okay, and he has had success in the past on the penalty kill. So, yes. Kapanen over Rust on the penalty kill is what's best for the Pittsburgh Penguins. But let's move over and talk a little bit about the premier pro-am hockey league in the summer. That is the Beauty League up in Minnesota. It had its final week this week, the champions being Team Tria, which I think is a is a car place up there. I don't, car place. I don't I don't know what it is, but you, you know, you see that one every year. They win the championship game eight to five to capture the John Scott Cup on that team. Two Pittsburgh Penguins, Jason Zucker, of course, very well known in the Minnesota area, former Minnesota Wild player, and Mitch Ranke, Wilkes-Barre Scranton defenseman was on that team. So congratulations to the two of them. Consolation prize for Teddy Bluger. He did not win the championship. He was in the championship game and scored two assists, but his big game was in the semifinals the night before on Tuesday. He scored seven points in a blowout victory, scoring four goals and three assists. And the highlight of the night got into a fight with Vinny Letary for, quote, running up the score. Listen, it, it's it's a basically a beer league game. They're going to run up the score because they're just out there to have fun. It's very, you know, very laid back and relaxed. But either way, Teddy Bluger draws blood on Vinny Letary in a fight in a summer league, which I thought was pretty good. And considering what we're seeing storyline-wise for NBA Pro-Ams in the summer, it's still better because nobody got seriously injured. Yes, Vinny Letary got cut up, but nobody got seriously injured. Meanwhile, Chet Holmgren has torn ligaments in his foot and is probably going to miss the beginning of the season. Huh, whoops. Um, no, the Teddy Blue thing's so interesting. First of all, where is this score whenever we need it? Secondly, <laughs> did we find a tough guy? I, I mean, it's... Hard to imagine that that was a shoot in any sort of in any sort of way. Shoots don't end in blood unless yeah, the WWE exactly. Of 2001. Exactly, that's kind of part of it. There was just it, the bloody face. And it was very. It wasn't even like a small cut. Like it was no. on his visor and everything. It looked like they had just gotten into it. Into it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an interesting fight. That I, I mean, really, if he's if he's going to task because of running up the score. I mean. Letary, did I mean your stats were disgusting in that league? I mean, <laughs> you you were leading the league in goals and points. I don't know. I think maybe you were running up a couple of scores here and there. Everybody does. It's it's barely. You, come on, you played you played nine games and ended up with like thirty four goals. <laughs> I think you're. I think you've done a little bit of running up yourself. Mm-hmm. But that's just nitpicking again. It's it's interesting. It's entertaining as long mm-hmm. as no one gets hurt. So be it. I've seen fights break out in literal meaningless uh beer league games i've seen fights break out in high school win line games i've mm. seen fights break out. you me and you have seen fights break out at the deck like, that was the, it, that was the last deck hockey game i i have played ended like, up the, the game didn't even end they just ended it there because there was a benches clearing brawl yeah it, it, i didn't it, start it by the way i did not start it no that referee started it but sure. and of all people that was then the refs get involved too it Hockey is the wildest. Recreation hockey is the wildest thing. One thing the beauty league has going for it is that there is some semblance, a real good semblance of organization to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this isn't, you know, just testosterone grown men, you know, feuding on ice. No, it's a legitimate summer league that I guess if some guys want to take it seriously, by all means, go ahead. I mean, it's not like we didn't take our deck hockey seriously. It's not like I didn't take my inline hockey seriously getting into a fight just seemed a little extreme but well, these, these are all professional athletes you have to remember that the competitive level yeah. the competitive just energy within them is something that i mean obviously we've both 
played sports before, organized sports. You get competitive. You get carried away in the moment. Mm -hmm. These guys are professionals. They have to turn it on for 82 games plus playoffs. Eventually, especially even in this where the stakes are the John Scott Cup, it's not pretty, it's not too high. It's, I believe it's a beer keg, but you still have that competitive spirit and that, that's what took them away. By the way, in that deck hockey game, that is the first and only time I've ever seen a referee spear a player like Edge <laughs> or Roman Reigns if you're new age. He completely, I, was it Brandon? It was Tyler. Tyler, yeah, completely speared the guy. I, I mean, it was a little high, I, I would say, probably a little high, but it was pretty good. Like, this, <laughs> this guy should try out for like, what was it, IHF? Whatever, I, I VW or something like that. There's a Pittsburgh. I don't know. Something like that. But it was a good spear, man. It, I, I give him credit. Now it shut everybody up. People stopped it, fighting. But it was it was solid. Boomed it through the crowd of people, too. I think that was the most impressive part. Like There was yeah. a crowd of people around the guy he hit, and he still managed to just, it's, like, no one was there. It's like if the Royal Rumble had all 30 participants, and somebody speared in the middle of it, and everybody else just basically jumped out of the ring and eliminated themselves. That was, it was, it was insane. Now, like I said, my last experience with deck hockey have not gone and played deck hockey since that moment not i haven't had it just because i've played in leagues up since then i have not experienced that sort of heat i'll say that <laughs> that's i mean it, it was yeah that reverberated throughout that entire season just came to a head that day but uh, to wrap this whole thing up they did announce the all beauty league team one pittsburgh penguin was named to that team which was jake gensel for the left wing spot and the MVP of the league with an asterisk next to it because got into a fight. Teddy Bluger named the MVP of the beauty league, but good on them. Now they're going to return to Pittsburgh for September 22nd in the opening of Pittsburgh Penguins training camp. We'll see if Bluger ends up shaving off that luscious flow that he had at the beauty league. He said he was going to, cause he doesn't score with it, but still four goals and three assists. I, I think he should keep it because I like any player that has the flow. He scored plenty. He scored plenty, but we're going to take one last quick break. When we come back, shout outs and call outs. Welcome back to the tip of the iceberg podcast brought to you as always by inside the penguins Dot com. We're going to finish the show off like we finish every single Thursday episode with our shout outs and our call outs. And Horwat, if you would allow me, I'll lead this off with my shout out. I'm shouting out the Vegas Golden Knights because they are the epitome this season of trying to outscore your problems. As of right now on Cap Friendly, they are $7.5 million over the NHL's salary cap. But, of course, Shea Weber, who they acquired in the offseason, will go on season-ending LTIR. Same with Robin Leonard, who will go on season-ending LTIR, which will cost about $12 million and get them right back under the NHL salary cap because <sighs> what else do we expect from the Vegas Golden Knights but to utilize LTIR to make themselves cap compliant? But the latest addition to that team is Phil the Thrill Kessel signing on a one-year deal 1.5 million dollars and let me just say vegas has so many cult hero status players that have played for their organization in the first six years we just add kessel to the list because we are going to see several if not thousands of phil kessel vegas golden knights jerseys throughout the entire country going forward goaltending is going to be an issue between laurent brassois and logan thompson but hey <laughs> they have the names can they outscore their problems? I guess we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, yeah, they, they get a bunch of cult heroes, and then they butcher their exits. So, yeah, I mean. We will see how this goes. Is there a trade clause on it? Because I, maybe Tesla gets traded without being told. Uh, I have not seen whether or not there's a trade clause. I was just seeing that Phil the Thrill, and a big week for hot dog people, yes. made, it to, uh, made it to the Vegas Golden Knights. That should be a ton of fun for him. He loves poker, so... I think yeah. he's going to thoroughly enjoy Vegas. Yeah, that, that, that's all there is to say yeah. about it. So, Horvath, what do you what do you got for your shout out, bud? I do want to shout out. Uh, this is a new one, just because uh, I didn't really have a good one, and then uh, the cat I'm house I'm house sitting for decided to become a special guest. So I'm going to shout yeah. out Lolly, I guess, because first of all, her nails need clipped. <laughs> Secondly. Um, yeah, she was just all over the place. Uh, this is the one time I'm going to suggest, if you're listening, go to the YouTube video and 
watch my scream, I guess, and <laughs> see how uh, she decided to uh, it uh, first appear in the screen quite perfectly off to the side. Mm-hmm. Whenever we were looking at jerseys, uh, I was hoping she would just stay there, but no, I had to literally no. interact with her. And yeah. uh, you know what? Just go back and watch. It's quite fun stuff. And cute little animals are cute little animals. I think I'm also allergic as hell to cats. Oh. So how uh, how sitting with two cats? One of them is where we basically stay here because the one needs meds, mm-hmm. but um. Yeah. It's not fun. I've been swallowing pills this in these past two weeks. Well, let me tell you something. And as somebody who owns two myself, when cats want attention, you will either give them attention or they will bug you until they give you attention. So I saw that playing out in real time. And if you go to our YouTube channel at Inside the Penguins, you can see that playing out in real time during our first segment because uh, she wanted to be part of the show and God damn it, she made herself part of the show. Is it better or worse than whenever I saw the spider behind my behind my computer? Whenever we were literally interviewing Brian Metzer, who I saw the other day, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It, it was not as good because the reaction of you seeing that spider behind your computer was pure joy for me. Uh, it was hilarious. And I kept rolling because I was like, ah, oh. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything about this. I but, kept rolling uh, no, too. I had great. to be so calm and just get rid of it while we're literally in the middle of an interview. <laughs> Hey, the things that you do when you record for three straight years. But let me move over to my call out. I'm calling out Jordan Peele because I loved Get Out. I loved Us. I think both of those were premier horror films. And he was doing everything in a different way. He was being revolutionary. And he was great. And I was so excited to see Nope. And it just didn't land. It it, it didn't land the plane. I liked the concept. I liked the idea of the story. It was very ambitious. I'll I'll give him that. It was a very hard thing to do, but it just felt like there were too many, one, ancillary things that did not matter and and, and just took me out of the main story. And and it just ruined it. It kind of sidetracked me and I didn't like it. And number two, I was not a fan of the visualization of the main antagonist. And if you don't know, it is a UFO, but go watch it if you want. Uh, I probably wouldn't see it again, probably won't watch it again. And I was just a little upset because, you know, the anticipation was high going in there thinking about okay get out was one of the best movies i've seen us was such a good second movie good follow-up his third one it's gonna be great had the same guy from get out uh daniel i can't remember his last name um but he's a great actor kiki palmer's great steve ewan from the walking dead's also in it so i was very excited and it it just it didn't meet my expectations i was a little upset leaving the theaters that day but calling out jordan peele nor he's two for three though so he's still batting 666 which for a horror film guy maybe that was the maybe that was the plan but uh nonetheless uh calling out jordan peele this week yeah those are all movies that i've never seen i figured you're not really a horror film guy that i just know that those have been highly touted so uh yeah i think that's it's interesting that sometimes you just make a clunker it happens hey everybody does it it happens sometimes we have clunkers of episodes (laughs) So yeah. when you do so something for so long, you're going to have a, have a down year. Mm-hmm. So um, take us home. Horowat. What's your call out this week? Call out again. It's going to be a little more conversational just because things, this, this didn't really anger me, but I'm curious about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the PGA ladies and gentlemen <laughs> have fired back at the live with a interesting take on a new golf league or event or whatever the hell it's supposed to be with tiger and Rory what is this, this TGL, this like in an, an, in a stadium, in an arena, but but also I think virtual golf thing. Uh, That's all I know about it. Um, You're letting the live get to you. Mm -hmm. One thing that the live did was create a new golf league. That's all they did. There's also the British league that exists or the European league, whatever it's called. There are other golf leagues out there that do things. You could have just done something different with your sport or something new with your sport that's not exactly this to become more interactive. Like, I think the European League has a popping YouTube channel where they send these guys out. At least at least it's an older thing. I don't know if they still do it. Mm-hmm. Where they give, like, their, their players, they say, here's 500 golf balls. Get a hole-in-one. And they spend the next 500 swings or however many it is trying to get a hole-in-one. Mm-hmm. But do something like that. Like get, I don't know, who's still left there. <laughs> get Tiger. Uh, get Tiger. Say hey Tiger. I know you've done it before in the actual tournaments, but here's a hole at a course 
in Jupiter, Florida. You don't have to go far from home. Just get a hole in one. We're gonna record you doing it. Be in inter- like be fun. Get crack jokes. I was trying to remember who's Scheffler. Scheffler, you're you're good at putting. Here's a fairway wood. Fuck, do something with it. I don't know. Do something entertaining, not whatever the hell this is gonna be, because I think it's gonna end up being too much. Here's the thing about the PGA. One, I will never watch that. that no, just, and that's the other I, thing too. Who's actually gonna watch won't. it? But two, do what you do best. Like if this league if the liv live tour is doing things differently and it's working for them that's fine do what you do best if you are the premier golf tour in the world prove it now they they lost to me they lost an opportunity to just accept the live tour for what it was and take advantage of the live tour and not try to go head to head with it and just say Mm -hmm. all right you know what we're gonna make it like a rider cup it's gonna be live versus pga Every year. That is a ratings machine. And it's simple, easy. And guess what? It doesn't have to be a gimmick. This new thing with Tiger Woods and Rory is a gimmick. And that's Mm -hmm. what it is. And nobody's going to watch it. I mean, I'm sure some people will watch it because they're hardcore PGA fans. And there's a couple of them that still exist. But at the end of the day, you're a golf tour. Just go golf. Like, literally. It, It is. Do what you do best. That, that's what you have to do. And going out and trying to do all these different things. I am excited that uh, Tiger Woods, what, 2K23 is coming out. That's uh, going to be fun. I don't play video games, but I, I used to love the Tiger Woods games. I used to love the NCAA games. And now they're all coming back out. Still not going to get video games. You're not going to get me back in GameStop anytime soon. But uh, nonetheless, no, uh, stay in your lane. I mean, not, they obviously do some different stuff, but yeah. don't try to reinvent the wheel because you're a golf league. In my head, I keep drawing this pga and live rivalry to wwe as the pga against the live in any of like aew ecw or uh the last one that caused uh monday night wars wcw wcw do like take advantage of what they're doing and realizing that they're getting popular and create something like wwe did don't try and overcompensate for so much like the new xfl is trying to do like you are a you are the, the the big thing, you know you're the big thing. Do fun things. Look mm-hmm. at what the W. I mean, don't directly start throwing mats and out on the courses and have wrestlers. But I mean, like, no. Utilize what they're doing and start rivalries somehow. Yeah. Give me the Sunday afternoon wars. Like, give like some entertainment. I mean, mm-hmm. it's there is there is more you can do. And we live in this new age where. You can like ramp up a social media presence. You could start doing a YouTube yeah. thing. You could do it. Call up Netflix. Get a big documentary crew out there. Record, like follow someone around. I don't know. I mean, yeah. that's kind of how F1 found a whole new group of yeah. fans and popped off to one of the biggest things in America. Yeah. Get a Netflix crew out there. Make a documentary about someone. Follow these guys mm-hmm. around. I don't know. There's yeah. other things you can do other than whatever this is going to be. I'm intrigued. I'll mm-hmm. watch clips, but I won't tune in to watch the whole thing. Well, here's the thing, and we'll end on this. When I say just not stay in your lane, because I hate that term, stay mm-hmm. in your lane, but do what you're good at. Look at why the match is so popular. It's four guys on a golf course playing around. Yeah, it, it, It's personalities. Just get the personalities in there. Highlight the personalities. It's something the NHL struggles with, too. Highlight your biggest personalities, and success will follow. But – That's going to do it for this episode of the Tip of the Iceberg. We will see you guys on Monday with more news and notes to talk about surrounding the Pittsburgh Penguins. Training camp less than a month away. We'll have you right up to it here at the Tip of the Iceberg. Have a good weekend, Pens fans. 